So now, finally, we get to the part where we're going to do the same thing, but for a bridge, import it from our Midas Civil. In this case, I'm going to import an arc bridge, arch bridge, and I'm going to create this soil and aboundment and the pile foundation around it and then run the analysis, a time history analysis. Oh, sorry. So in this case, uh, I just imp the only step uh, I've done here was I imported the same kind of uh, DXF file, sorry, MXT file. Usually when it's imported, it's going to be just like this, where it doesn't show the properties being activated. The properties have been imported, as you can see, see here in the works tree. It looks yellow, um, it looks just like wires, but you can actually visualize these properties and activate them just to, you know, for you to confirm that these have indeed been imported. And the other thing is, uh, also to save time, I've already defined the material properties as we had shown in the previous. So in this case, we have several ground layers. We have rock, we have some weathering soil, we have some soft rock that have been created for this, for this analysis. But from here, we can go ahead and just start with the geometry aspect. In the other model, we've shown how to draw and extrude. In this case, uh, we actually have a particular tutorial that's for a bridge aboutment. So it shows all the steps for how to create the aboutment itself. And gladly, I will show you where you can find this video or in this tutorial. But for this instance, again, for saving time, I'm just going to import this cat file of that other model that has the ground created around it. So here it's just, we see there's different formats for CAD files that we can import. In this case, I'm importing a uh, .xt format. And this basically is importing geometry, solids, lines, and surfaces. So what I'll do from here is I'm going to modify this geometry so that I can use it for my bridge. The first thing I want to do is I want to translate it. I go to here to my Transform Translate tab, and I'm just going to select everything on the geometry aspect, and it's, I could do it by direction. I could tell it, you know, go X distance, and go Y, then a different distance, or I can use this function that's really neat that's called two-point vector. So all I have to do is tell it I want to connect this point from this structure with, let's say, this point of this other structure. And it'll calculate it for me after I press this distance button. And I also have a preview button here. So we see here in orange that it lights up. And it actually it connects and lights up exactly where I want it to. So I can just go ahead and do OK. So that's the first step. Now we can see here that the bridge itself is wider than the aboutment that I was created you know, in a different tutorial. It wasn't necessarily for this bridge in mind. It was just an example. But what I can do is I can modify the scale of my geometry to match this bridge. So I can go here again to transform scale and I can again select my geometries and what I want to do is first I want to tell it I want to keep it at a center this being the position of where I want it relatively to be but what I can do now is give it a non-uniform scaling and what I'm really interested in, in this case is I want to make it wider. As we can see here, it's in the y-axis that I'm concerned with. So let's say I just say 1.5 scale factor. And if I go preview, it shows me, you know, I can see in the blue where the original is, and it shows me in orange where it's going to be. But it also kind of lets me see that now the aboutment will be wide enough for this bridge. So I can just go and say OK. And it does kind of look like that's, you know, a good fit. So now what I can do is I can copy this geometry, mirror it uh, around some planes so that I can then, you know, just, I'm going to activate these planes in the origin, the XYC origin of the model. I'm going to go here to mirror. Again, I'm going to select my geometries and I'm going to select this plane just for, to keep it easy. And if I go to preview, I want to make a copy of it, and now I have my two geometries, and then again, I just have to translate this geometry, again using two-point vector to line it up. So I want this point to line up with this point. I go here to calculate the distance, and if I do preview, again, we see the structure now is going to line up nicely with where I want it. We can see even the piles are being copied. This import was not just surfaces and 
solids, but I also imported geometries like lines and piles that were drawn uh, in the other tutorial. So I can just go to OK. So now we have a pretty good setup of where we are. And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to actually merge some of these ground solids. As we see here, they're overlapping with each other. For that, we have Boolean operations. I'm going to use the command fuse. So I want to com combine this with that, these first layers, go to apply. I want to combine the middle layer with the other middle layer, go to apply, and the bottom layer with the other bottom layer, and go to OK. So now if I deactivate um, from here my surfaces and my curves, we see that these are indeed now considered single solids. So in this point, I would be ready to mesh my geometries. What I'm going to do is to make sure that there's no problem with connections between these layers or these other geometries, I can check what we call duplicates. Basically, what Midas is considering a duplicate is something that was in touch with a different surface. And it's got, it has to light up orange for you to know that the meshing will be done properly. So in this case, we see we have different layers, soil layers. Since we have three, we should expect to see two surfaces in between. And we also see that the aboutments themselves light up, and that's just basically confirming to me that the aboutment and the embankment are going to be properly connected. Had this not been the case, I couldn't use a tool called AutoConnect under the format, format or the method Boolean, and I could select, if I wanted to really, just to be safe, I could just select everything and apply it, and then again do my AutoConnect. But in this case, we're fine. So now we're ready to mesh. What I'm going to do is uh, first mesh the aboutments so that I can properly uh, connect the nodes of the bridge to the structure itself. So I'm going to first just hide this aboutment, uh, this embankment and this embankment. You can easily, you easily saw that all I had to do was as I select something in my window, it lights up in my works tree and I can easily choose it. So let's go to now the mesh window we, or tab. We, everything we've been working on at this point, because it was geometry, was in the geometry tab. Now we can go to the mesh tab since we're ready to, you know, do meshing. So the program is very intuitive, very easy to follow in that respect. That once you're done with the meshing, then you move on to the type of analysis you want to do. You create the analysis case, and then you just see the results, right? So let's do some 3D meshing. I'm going to select this aboundment and this aboundment. I'm going to give it a size of 0.5. I'm going to give it the material property of the aboutment. And also, actually, because I'm, I have a structure in place that I want to make sure the nodes are going to merge, I can actually go here and expand this to some advanced options. We see here we have, amongst some things, uh, you can create higher order elements and such. But we also see we have a tolerance for merging the nodes. So I'm going to reduce this tolerance so that I can guarantee that my nodes are properly connected. And then I'm going to uh, deactivate the properties here to make it a little easier to see once we're merging. So here again, I can do the preview button. And if I close up, we see where the nodes are going to be. And we start to see that these nodes line up with the nodes of my structure. I mean, this was obviously predetermined. But you kind of have a sense of that, that if you know the dimensions of your structure and or dimensions of both of your structures, so you can give it a size or a size control that will allow these nodes to line up and that way your tolerance has makes sense. So then I can just apply this and we see we run, we run both and now when I inspect it we do see in fact that these nodes uh, are connected. I can activate the nodes and if I wanted to double check I could just inspect the number. We see here there's no number overlapping, 31 node is shared by the bridge and the aboutment. We could actually apply different conditions for maybe releasing the moment or some other kind of like control on that connection. But for this case, let's just say it's, you know, it's merged, it's a rigid connection. So now I would merge, uh, sorry, I would mesh the rest of the structure. Uh, I'm going to mesh the aboutment mats or rafts. It has the same material property. Let's give it a bigger size. And again, I could inspect this con this um, connection. And we can see here that the nodes also lighten up nicely between the two sets. 
but because they give it a bigger size, it gradually grows away. So the software will do its best to connect the two different sizes, but then keep the rest a uniform size as you gave it. So then I can reactivate my embankments. I believe uh, it's one of these. That's one, and this is the other. Okay. And I will mesh these embankments as well. All I have to do now is assign it a different property, embankment. Give it a different name so it's easy to find. And then let's give it a bigger size just to keep it easier. And it's, uh, not, the file's not so heavy. So again, we see here we've meshed that. And again, the connection is very small here, but it gradually grows. We can then mesh the first soil layer. In this case, we're going to say it's weathering soil. Let's give it an even different size. We mesh the middle layer, which would be the uh, soft rock. And then we mesh the bottom layer, in this case, which would be just rock. Let's give it a bigger size. So we've essentially meshed all our solids. And now, because we have some piles in this case, I'm going to deactivate uh, everything and just leave the piles activated or activate the geometry of the pile so we can mesh those as well. If I go here to my works tree, we see that there's a lot of lines that were imported from the other um, model from the cat file. But we see here that the parts correspond to the piles. It's actually separated by part and line. So I'm just going to deactivate the lines here and that should leave me just my piles as we see now. So now I can just go to mesh 1D. I'm going to select everything assign it the pile property that I uh, had already created. And then what I want to do is to properly simulate the interaction between the ground and the piles, uh, Midas allows you to create or use interface. We have a particular interface for piles in which you can then just define some material properties. Uh, let me show you here this interface pile property you would define some material, you know, ground properties. Shear stiffness modulus KT has to do with what's tangent, and normal stiffness modulus has to do with what's normal to the surface of these, basically, springs, or sorry, of these piles. So we act, uh, we add, the, add those. Let's just separate these into interface. And then we can also simulate a pile tip. And again, for the pile tip, you can assign some properties like tip, uh, tip bearing capacity, uh, tip spring stiffness to properly, um, I guess, model that behavior of the pile up against the ground. So for this, I just try to select only the notes, the very last notes. of my piles. And so now I have the piles with the interface and the pile tips. What I want to do is actually, maybe it's just a custom from where we work, I'm going to add a constraint. I'm going to keep it from rotating in the C direction, the piles. So I can just activate this and call this RC. So now everything is meshed and we would be ready to run a you know, depending on the boundary conditions and what we wanted to do, we're ready to run an analysis. So in this case, I'm going to first, because we're doing a seismic analysis, first we have to do a eigenvalue analysis. What I need to do is obtain the vibration modes of the two biggest modes with the most uh, mass participation. So then we're going to use those periods, those frequencies of those vibration modes later uh, for the damping method. So what I need to do here is first apply uh, some ground surface springs. Let me go back to the presentation so you kind of see what I'm talking about or where we are. So we've done up to this part. We've meshed the ground and we've meshed the piles and, you know, everything. So I want to create these ground surface springs. Uh, software will do this auto-calculate auto it, automatically create this. Uh, but the only value I need to input is the modulus of elasticity coefficient. These are the equations used, and these are the terms that are used to auto-calculate this. The only, uh, I just choose from this table, I'm going to choose the value 2. There's different tests and different methods to show how to get these values. There's a little more theory to it. But, you know, for this purpose, uh, time purpose, I'm just going to, you know, take it from that table. 
sorry, I believe, uh, not this one, here, okay. So I will go to Mesh, Elements, Create, Other, and from here we have, you know, Point Springs, Matrix, Rigid Links, Elastin Links. What I want to use is Ground Surface Spring. And here is what I was showing. We input uh, the modulus of coefficient of elasticity coefficient, and it'll calculate for us the modulus of subgroup reaction. I also want to activate fixed bottom to simulate like a bedrock in this case. And from here on, I just have to select the sets of the solids. There should be nine that I select in the end. And the program will calculate these surface spring properties depending on the material of the ground itself or the properties of the ground itself for me. So from then, I can just create an eigenvalue analysis case and run this and get my vibration modes. We see here now, we see these little S's that are representing the surface springs, and we see the rigid, the fixed boundary condition at the bottom. So now that I have these two, uh, these boundary conditions, I can go here now to add what would be a eigenvalue analysis. and I activate the conditions and what I want to consider. In analysis control, I can tell it how many modes of vibration I wanted to consider. Let's say it's 30, and I can control some other things, uh, define a water level, storm sequence check, you know, mass calculate, or a couple mass calculations, stuff like that. And then I could just run it. And while this is running, let's just skip to a part that I've already done for time's sake. So here we see in the results, now we're in the post-processor. I have the vibration modes, and I also have this table. This table allows me, you know, some information. We see here the periods and the cycles for all the different vibration modes. If I go to the bottom, I can see the percentage of mass participation. So in this case, we have um, the case 1 and case 5, or mode 5, in the y direction. This is x, y in the y direction, which is where the direction I want to apply my, my load, uh, these seem to be the ones with the most participation. So I can go back and write down or copy what would be the, let's just say the period. We could also do it by frequency, but the periods of these modes. So in this case, we have 0.952, and we have 0.637. So these numbers we're going to use later as a control of the damping for those principal modes of participation. So once we have that information, let me just pretend that I took a screenshot of that or I wrote it down somewhere. I will go back to my preprocessor mode and what I want to do is add some dampers now to my boundary conditions. So I go back to mesh, I go to create, again I go to other, and again, I select ground surface spring. This time, I choose here damping. I don't need to create another case for the fixed bottom. I'm just going to call these the dampers. And again, I select the same soil layers. Or basically, all the solid layers. And I go to OK. Again, the program will calculate this for me automatically. We've seen here some of the vibration modes. We created this analysis case. This is what I was talking about where we see the, the main modes with mass participation and we write down those periods. And then this is how the program automatically calculates for you the damping constant. Uh, and you know we have the primaries, the CP, the CS, the primary secondary waves. And we could also then now add, uh, after adding these dampers, basically add the function for the ground acceleration. So what we will do is go back, we saw here, um, this was the original model that I left running, it took a minute to run the eigenvalue analysis for this model, um, actually I think in a different, I was in a different step where I've already added the ground springs, the dampers. Yes, this is the model that I was working with. Um, so now I would go here to dynamic analysis, and 
what I would do is uh, I would do here ground acceleration. I can choose the direction that I want to add it. We see here that we have a scale factor. So I could potentially add the same acceleration function in two directions. There's a different uh, session, a different tutorial that we show where varying the scale factors, uh, you can actually make it to be at an angle between the two. So what I want to do is here add a time function. I could choose one from our database. We have like earthquakes from all over the world. Or you could actually just copy paste your own table from an Excel sheet. Let's say here I have different seismic, uh, different time accelerations or function, acceleration functions for different earthquakes. I can just copy paste directly, control V on my keyboard. And we have the acceleration function. Sorry, I had done this session earlier today and we're showing some different um, ones that I've applied. So from here then I just choose, uh, this is off as uh, reference to the name of the seismic, from the seismic function in Japan. And so I just create it. Uh, let's just say two. Okay. Um, in this case, again, I'm sorry, I, I had done this session previously today and I forgot to undo what I had done. So here's the, just basically that ground acceleration we've created. We have the dampers. And so now we can just go and create a new analysis case for time history, nonlinear time history. And we would deactivate the ground surface springs. Uh, MIDAS allows you if you have loads, you can convert those loads to masses to be considered for the seismic analysis. What we also want to consider are the dampers we created. Oh, in this case, they're already there. And the boundary conditions. So again, we do the fixed bottom, the rotation of the piles, and the uh, dynamic function we did. Lastly, we do a time step. We want the time step here to match. We give it a length. We want it to match this increment period to match the increment that we've been using or that we see in our time steps for the function itself. So in this case, it's 0 0.062. And we can vary the size of the output file by saying, like, every 10 steps give me a result. So here we see there's 162 steps. And lastly, what I need to do is I'm going to um, create here by the damping method input for the two principal calculate the modal damping by the periods of what was the most participation that we got from our eigenvalue analysis. So if I recall, it was something like 9.35. Uh, you want to use all the digits that you can from your table, and we use a 5% damping. And then the second mode was something like 6, 3, 4, 7 or something. And again, a 5%. Again, you, you probably use all the you know values from your table that you copied or you, down, you wrote down. And then from here, you just basically run the analysis, the time history analysis. For time purposes, let's just jump into one that I've already uh, concluded. Here we have, I'm in the post-processor, and I'm looking here at some of the results. We have all the different time steps. We can see here results for displacements of the ground. Again, I have a little tab down here. It can allow me to make a movie with all the different time steps of this earthquake. Uh, here it's a little fast, but now it's actually going a little lo slower. I can save this format that I can then use in a presentation or such. Uh, we can also see results for, you know, reactions. Uh, we can see the accelerations. But also see structural results like your pile forces or your, you know, beam actual forces on your bridge or the bending moments, and such. Lastly, what I want to show you is Midas recently added where you can do construction stage analysis and the last step be a, a seismic uh, step, a time history analysis. So let's just say here we have the initial ground condition. Uh, the This part itself has a material property of the ground. As I move down in my construction stages, we see here there's a step where this has been excavated, the where the, the raft will go. And then in the next step, the structure itself has been installed with the piles, but this, this same mesh that has been reactivated with a different material property of the aboutment. Then we have the embankment created around it. Then we, you know, have the bridge. And lastly, we will have, like, the other steps of the seismic function. So we can actually also do construction stage, keep those stresses from the construction stages, and then run a time history analysis. 
So I'm right at the time of uh, of the hour allotted. Uh, basically, these are the steps that we just shown, the results, uh, bending moments. You know, we can easily do byte points. And so in conclusion, you know, thanks to these advancements in what is numerical analysis, we've seen now the rapid rise of these superstructures, particularly in places that we probably wouldn't have seen before, uh, you know, the difficult ground conditions. And so we're seeing a lot of this development, let's say, in the Middle East, where we have superstructures in soft or sandy grounds. It's all due to these new kinds of numerical analysis that allows us users to really get a good idea of how their raft and piles are going to behave with the ground through the direct method. Of, you know, some more complicated ground conditions, which is the most important part of your project, you probably want to use a geotech software and ideally do the, use the direct method.